Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. So if you want to grab your, uh, your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, there are copies of the scripture on the back table there. Feel free to uh, grab a copy if you need one. So Matthew chapter 14, we're going to begin looking in verse 22. Verse 22. Now, some of you may already know this, uh, but I went to college in Pensacola, Florida. Now, if you're not particularly familiar with Floridian geography, Pensacola is located in the panhandle of Florida, right on the Gulf of Mexico. So if you take your hand, and this is the shape of Florida, Pensacola is right there. It's almost in Alabama. Do you know what loves the Gulf of Mexico? Hurricanes and tropical storms. All right. Now, thankfully, during my time when I was down in Pensacola, we only, had to, we only experienced one named hurricane. That was Hurricane George's in October of 1998. But we did have quite a few tropical storms and depressions while I was down there. Now, growing up in northern Virginia, I grew up in Loudoun County, hurricanes and tropical storms, they were things that we heard about on the news, but we never really experienced them. We might get some wind, we might get some rain, but we never got a full-on storm. But when you're about to experience your first one, it can be a little scary. There's a sense of dread that something bad is going to happen. Now, thankfully, the architects and the engineers of the campus buildings, they knew what they were doing, and they had prepared and built the campus to withstand those storms. So when we were told in October of 1998 that we needed to stay in our rooms, in fact, this was the first and only time I remember them canceling church when I was down there. When we were told we had to stay in our rooms, I knew I was going to be safe. There might be some problems, but my faith was strong because I knew that the building and the room that I was going to be in was strong. Now, in our passage today, Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22, we're going to see the disciples in the midst of a storm and how putting faith in Jesus in the midst of that storm is what is needed most in order for our faith to remain strong. So let's read, beginning in verse 22. We're going to read down through verse 33. It says this, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a, long, was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, at the end of the previous section, which we looked at last time I preached, Jesus had fed 5,000 men, not including the women and children, with only a small amount of food. You remember, it was five loaves and two fish. This was truly a miracle. And in doing this, Jesus was teaching his disciples that they needed to find their satisfaction in him. However, over in John chapter 6, which is another telling of this story, we see that things were starting to get a bit out of hand with the crowds that had gathered. They were so excited by what Jesus had done that they were seeking to make him their king right then and there. And it was likely that Jesus' disciples were going to get caught up in this fury. Um, so Jesus knew he needed to get them out of there. So Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Now, after dismissing the crowds, Jesus went up into the mountains by himself to pray. 
And there are a number of reasons for this when you read all of the accounts of this event. First, as I've already mentioned, Jesus wanted time alone to pray. Prayer was extremely important in the life of Jesus, and he often went off by himself to pray. And I think this should also serve as an important reminder to each one of us. If Jesus needed to take time to pray, how much more should you and I desire to be in prayer? One writer pointed out that this was an important event in the ministry of Jesus. At the beginning of his time of ministry, Jesus spent 40 days in prayer before Satan came to tempt him away from his mission as the Messiah. Now the crowds, they were trying to do the same thing, so it would make sense that Jesus would spend time praying about what was taking place. Second, Jesus also needed some time to rest. That was the original reason for going to that location in the first place, before the crowds found out and came to find him. And third, with the growing plans to make Jesus a king, he wanted to dismiss the crowds and get the disciples away before they could be swayed by the crowd's desires. Now, while Jesus was praying, what were the disciples doing? The disciples were in the boat, and they were attempting to cross the water, and they had been doing it for a rather significant period of time. They had probably departed in the boat at around 7 or 8. The Bible tells us that they left in the evening time. And Matthew 14, 24 tells us that the boat was a long way from the land. Over in John chapter 6, it, we are told that the boat was about three or four miles from the shore. But because the wind and the waves were against them, the disciples were having a really difficult time with what was going on. And in fact, even though they had left at about seven or eight in the evening, they were still trying to cross during the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch was, a, was between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. That's a really long time to have only gone three or four miles. Now at this point, it's at this point in the evening that Jesus comes to them walking on the water, walking on the sea. And clearly in their exhausted state, the disciples didn't recognize him. They saw him walking on the water and something likely short-circuited in their thinking. Like they're looking out and they go, do you see that? That looks like a man. Wait, we're in the middle of the water. How can there be a man on the water? Man can't walk on water. And what does the Bible tell us? They immediately went, oh, no, it's a ghost. Right? It, it was probably more dramatic than that, but oh, no, it's a ghost. They were terrified at the sight of someone walking on the water. Now, to be fair, to be fair, I think it's safe to say that if we were in a boat We've been in the boat for six or seven hours. We're tired, we're exhausted, and we're not making much progress. And we see a man walking on the water. What's our first thought going to be? Probably going to think it's a ghost, right? We're going we're to get upset. They likely thought that it was a sign that they were going to die, that this was an omen of their impending doom. Their fear was expected, and it was justified. And this is when Jesus comes to them and brings comfort to them. Look at what he says to them. He says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Those words carry a lot of importance, and we're going to come back to that phrase here in just a moment. But what was the effect of those words from Jesus? There seemed to be some peace brought to the disciples in the boat. Peter, his response, he responds by saying, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, this was a big step for Peter because it was no easy task for him to get out of the boat, to get onto the water. This boat, it wasn't just a small canoe. He was probably several feet um, on the deck from, from the water below. It was probably a fairly significant drop once he got out there to the water below. But what we see is that Peter stepped out of the boat in faith. He believed that the voice that told him to take heart was Jesus, and he had faith to trust that it was. And in doing so, trusting that it was Jesus, Peter was also able to do the impossible. He also walked on the water. 
Now we all know what happens next. Once Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and became overwhelmed by the storm around him, he immediately began to sink. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk on water. When I was younger, I would go to the pool during the summer. I'm like, I'm going to walk on this water. Never happened. Always got wet. But Peter began to immediately sink. Thankfully, Jesus was right there to save him and pulled him back up out of the water. And after pulling, G- pulling Peter from the water, Jesus and Peter got into the boat, at which point the storms and the wind immediately ceased. And at this point, those in the boat began to worship Jesus, declaring that he was truly the Son of God. Now, with a passage of Scripture that's as familiar as this one, it can be easy for us to lose sight of who the hero or what the main point of the passage is. Many times when we hear this passage read or we hear a sermon on this passage, we often come away with Peter as the main character and Peter's faltering faith as a moral for us to avoid. But the truth is, is that Jesus is the hero of this passage. And Jesus was using the storm and the walking on the water to teach the disciples that their faith was only as strong as the object that it was grounded in. And what could be stronger than the sovereign creator of the universe? This passage, it teaches us three things about the nature of Jesus And it points us toward the ultimate object of our faith. So the first thing that I want us to see, the first thing that we can learn about Jesus, is that Jesus is sovereign over his creation. Now that word sovereign, it gets used a lot. In fact, later this service, we're going to sing a song called Sovereign Over Us. It it gets used a lot, particularly by folks in church. So it's helpful for us to understand what that word means. In the Bible... The word sovereign refers to God's ultimate authority over all created things because he's the creator of all of those things. This is why Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. We can then say that Jesus is sovereign over all things because Jesus is God the Son And Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 through 17 states, For by him, we're talking about Jesus, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, in Matthew 14, 22 through 33, our passage, there are multiple ways in which Jesus demonstrates his sovereignty over all things to the disciples. The first thing we see is that he demonstrates, the first, first we see he demonstrates his sovereignty when he sent the disciples out into the boat. There is no doubt that Jesus knew what the disciples were going to experience when he told them to get into the boat and sail to the other side. There's no doubt at all that when Jesus put the disciples in the boat and said, I'll meet you on the other side, he knew what they were about to experience. Jesus was fully aware of the storm that would test the pers- their perseverance and the lesson that he was going to teach them through these circumstances. He knew these things because he ordained, he put them in place to happen. The circumstances of the evening were put in place by Jesus as God the Son to teach his disciples about the nature of faith. Only the sovereign God of the universe could do those things. Second, Jesus demonstrated the sovereign, his sovereignty by walking on the water. By walking on water, Jesus was showing that he was God over the water. In Job chapter 9, verse 8, it states, Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Walking on the water was a role that was reserved for God. And here was Jesus walking on the water. But not only that, look at what Jesus says to his disciples when they were afraid. He said, take heart, it is I. 
Does that phrase sound familiar to you? In the original languages that the Bible's written in, Jesus is using the same words that God used in Exodus chapter 3 when he was speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. Jesus was telling his disciples as he was doing the impossible, walking on the water, that he was God. He was saying, take heart, I am. Just as importantly, Jesus was visibly teaching the disciples that nothing was more powerful than he was. We also see that Jesus is sovereign over his creation in verse 32 when the wind ceased once Peter and Jesus were back in the boat. This storm had been raging for hours. Clearly, if they got in at 7 o'clock and it was between 3 and 6 in the morning, this storm had been going on for quite some time. It had been raging for hours, causing the disciples to struggle against the waves for so long, and it suddenly ceases at the command of Jesus. Jesus is sovereign over his people, determining where and when they will go. He is sovereign over creation, treading on waves and walking on water like it's solid ground. And he is sovereign over storms, calming winds and waves with just his presence. Do you find comfort in that? Think about that for just a moment. There is comfort in that. The sovereign God of creation is Jesus, the one that we are trusting as our only hope in life and in death. This should give us a different perspective on the storms and the difficulties of life. While the disciples were struggling in the boat, Jesus knew what was taking place. Why? Because he's the one who sent them into the storm in the first place. Jesus had complete control over both the disciples and the storm that they were facing. This is an important truth for us to remember when we're facing difficult and uncertain times. Now, I don't know what the new year holds for each of us. Many of us are probably hoping that all of the difficulties of 2022, uh, they're, they're going to be over today. Like last night at 12 o'clock, all problems are done, right? We get, to, we get to hit this big reset button, and we get a brand new, fresh set of days. While that may not be the case, we can trust that Jesus is not unaware of what we are going through. He knows the challenges that each one of us will face this year because he's in control of those challenges. It's likely, it likely won't make the challenges any less challenging, but we can find comfort in knowing that Jesus knows the plans he has for us and that he is working all things for our good. And why? Because Jesus is sovereign over his creation. Brings us to point number two. Jesus is present in the storm. Now, not only is Jesus sovereign over his creation, but he's also present in the storm. After putting the disciples on a boat and dismissing the crowds, what did Jesus do next? He went into the mountains to pray. This had been his, deci his desire from the beginning, but took time to minister to the crowds that had gathered. Now, while Jesus was in the mountains, the disciples were attempting to sail to the other side. I say attempting because, as we've already seen, there was a storm that was keeping them from doing what they had set out to do. And you may be thinking, well, Jonathan, you just said that Jesus was present in the storm, but right now the disciples are in the boat and Jesus is in the mountain. He's not with the disciples. How can he be present in the storm if he's not in the storm? And that's true, but let's look again at what Jesus was doing. He's praying. And while this passage doesn't specifically state what Jesus was praying about, there are other passages that let us know that Jesus had been praying for his disciples. In Luke 22, it tells us that Jesus prayed specifically for Peter that his faith would not fail. So while he wasn't physically in the boat with the disciples at that very moment, Jesus was with them in spirit through his prayers to the Father. 
Have you ever been dealing with a storm in your own life? Something that you think might wipe you out? Right? I, I, I know some of your stories, I know that many of you have experienced that very thing. In reality, the storm that the disciples were experiencing, it wasn't a major crisis to them. Several of them were experienced fishermen and were likely used to these types of conditions. But they had been struggling against the wind and the waves for hours. They, they, they were hoping that it was going to end, and it just continued on. They had just spent all day ministering to the crowds, and now they were fighting the weather conditions well into the night. They were physically and emotionally exhausted. Is that where you find yourself today? You've been struggling with a storm in your life that is leaving you physically or emotionally exhausted. And you're wondering, how much more can you take before this is over? You may be even wondering, where is Jesus in the midst of what I'm going through? I want you to know that Jesus knows what you are going through. And at this very moment, he is with you in the storm because he's praying for your faith not to fail. I love these verses in Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who, excuse me, who can be against us? He, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, know that no matter the struggle or the storm that you're going through at this moment, you're not going through it alone. Jesus is interceding for you at the right hand of God, and nothing, no financial concern, no medical diagnosis, no relationship issue is going to be able to separate you from Jesus. And notice how Jesus brought comfort to the disciple in the midst of their fear. They weren't afraid of the storm, but seeing a man walk on the water, yeah, that was scary to them. They took it as an omen that they were going to drown. But there, in the midst of the storm, Jesus came and brought comfort. He revealed himself to be the I am, the one that they had learned about all their lives. This I am was the one who brought the Jewish slaves out of Egypt. And this is the I am who led the people into the promised land. This I am was the one who was coming to them in the storm. And Peter, you got to love Peter, says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And one writer said that a better way of saying this was, a better way to look at Peter's statement is instead of saying, Lord, if it's you, Lord, since it is you. Peter had faith that since it was Jesus out there in the water, there was enough power and authority for him to join him. So he did. And as long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. As long as if it, was, it was when he put his eyes on the waves that Peter began to sink. When Peter was trusting in Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. It was when his eyes were turned elsewhere that he sank. And Peter's immediate response was to cry out to the only one who could save him at that moment, 
and that was Jesus. Jesus was there to pull Peter up and bring him to himself. Now, if we aren't careful, we can see Peter's words, or Jesus' words to Peter as a rebuke for his amount of faith. But that's not what's happening here. Peter didn't lose his faith. He simply put his faith in the wrong things. Our faith is only as strong as the object that we're trusting in. Jesus wanted Peter to learn to keep his eyes on him no matter what was taking place around him. Now, how often do we do the same thing as Peter? We find ourselves in the midst of a storm and we lose sight of the true object of our faith. We become overwhelmed by all that's going on around us. It feels like we're going under when the solution is to turn our eyes back to Jesus. In the midst of a storm, Jesus is there to serve as our strength. Like the words of the old song go, and I might start singing, so bear with me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When storms come our way, church, keep your eyes on Jesus. There will be times, excuse me, there will be times when we are weak and we are tired. Praise God that Jesus will be there in the storm to be our strength and to pull us up to him. And that brings us to our third point. Jesus is worthy of praise. Jesus is sovereign over his creation. Jesus is present in the storm. And Jesus is worthy of worship. When Jesus and Peter got back into the boat, there was peace. The winds immediately ceased. And after witnessing all that took place, the disciples worshiped, declaring that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, this was the first time that the disciples had made such a declaration. They had witnessed so many of Jesus' miracles up to this point, but they still hadn't fully grasped who he was. Now they were beginning to understand that this was the Son of God. Jesus' revelation of who he was began to clear away some of the fog, and their response was to worship. The more we learn about Jesus, the stronger our desire to worship him will be. There's a saying that goes, theology leads to doxology. This means the more knowledge we have of Jesus, the more we are to worship him. The Bible is full of reasons that God is worthy of worship. And Jesus, being God the Son, is worthy for those same reasons. But the most important reason for us to worship Jesus is that through him and through him alone, our sins are forgiven. No amount of trying to increase our faith will save us. No amount of work on our part will erase the debt of sin that we owe. It is only through faith in Jesus, the source of our faith, that our sins are forgiven and we're reconciled to God. Jesus is truly worthy of our worship. Now, at the beginning of this new year, it's impossible for us to know what tomorrow is going to hold. We have no way of knowing what things will come our way in the future. When the disciples set out in the boat, they had no idea they would struggle against the waves and the wind for hours without making any progress. The same is true of you and me, even though we may not be getting into the boat in any time in the near future. Some of you might be going on a cruise tomorrow. I don't know, right? But we don't know what what the future is going to hold for us. The way we can face the storms is through faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus, knowing that he is sovereign over his creation. 
He is present with us in the storm. And he is truly worthy of our worship. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that Jesus truly is sovereign over all creation and that he is present with us in the storms and that he is worthy of our worship. And Father, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, we have no idea what 2023 holds for us. We have no idea of the good things that are coming our way. We have no idea of the difficult, challenging things that are going to come our way. But Father, I pray that for each one of us that's here this morning, each one that's watching via the live stream, each one who may hear this sermon later on, that the source of our faith, that our faith would be grounded in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone, because he is truly the source of our strength. So that when we are in the midst of those storms, when when it feels like things are crashing down around us, when we are weak and we're tired and we're ready to give up, we can look to Jesus as our strength and know that he is present with us in those storms and that right now he's interceding for us at the right hand of God. Father, we we thank you so much for those truths and I pray that you would make them a reality to us this year. We ask all this in your beautiful name. Amen.